and I'm sure Eve is in the in the in the mm -hmm. ether somewhere as well. I don't see her. Uh, one thing that I found nice for these kind of classes where we have a lot of people is if you want, after you get to enjoy seeing all the different faces uh, in the grid, uh, if you'd rather just have the speaker view, you can scroll up to the upper right corner and there you'll either see a grid and you click on the grid and then you'll see everybody. Or if you see a speaker view, you click on speaker view and then you get to see whoever's talking, you know, and then um, maybe less visual distraction. So if I'm talking, you'll see me. If Eve is talking, you'll see her. Eve, are you here? I'm here. Oh, great. See, if you're <laughs> on speaker view, you get to see her pop up. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> okay, great. So let's uh, settle in. Thank you, uh, Katie, for making this possible. Mm -hmm. So let's take a moment and drop in, take some breaths and into our bellies and release any tension with the out breath. Allow the eyes to close and your attention to turn into the inner space. and feel any whirlwind of thoughts or physical energetic swirlings in the body just come down and settle like the dust in a or the the soot in a muddy pond slowly settling create a nice clear limpid pool of water with your mind Feel the muscles of your face relax, the muscles of your shoulders relax with each out breath. The belly soft, the low back, the hips, the legs, the feet, everything just nice and relaxed, aligned with gravity. Feel that sense of ease and presence with the breath in the body, in the moment. And then from the depths of the well of your being, bring forth a heartfelt motivation for your practice and your study, your life. If you wish, bring your hands in prayer as a way to seal that aspiration. Set your intention. To practice, to be of benefit, to heal yourself and help to heal others. And may our time together be healing in many dimensions, seen and unseen in this time of uncertainty. This time of fear, this time of also healing and opportunities. Thank you. Yamaho, how wonderful. That's a common way of ending a prayer in Tibetan. Emaho, it means, oh, how wonderful or how marvelous. So it's a common way to, like an exclamation point. May it be so. <laughs> so mm. And yeah, Eve. Thank you, Chandra, for opening and welcome everyone. It's really such a delight for us to be here with you all. Um, we've been really looking forward to figuring out a way to be of support to be together, to be in connection. And this evening, we're really looking forward to sharing specific practices that hopefully can be useful for you, not only here, but with your loved ones and for the days to come. And these are by no means new practices, uh, definitely ancient wisdom and practices that may be familiar to you. And I'm just excited to see what happens when we generate all of these good intentions together. I wanna to highlight that we are part of the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And so, 
fortunate to be teachers there and fortunate to be Sangha all together. And though we're meeting in a virtual space, we still want to uphold the same core values and expectations of community. And really simply, we can think of that as being compassionate in our thoughts, in our speech, in our behavior, being open and understanding that we have no idea what's going on for everybody else on this call. That's always true, maybe now even more than ever. So as we enter into this virtual space together, I really encourage you to think of our intention together as community and to be sensitive and thoughtful about what may be stirred up for people here and maybe make them quicker to feel despair or irritation and just to be as gentle and as kind as we can with one another, even in this virtual space as we grow in community together. Chandra, you are muted. There you go. Sorry, I'm multitasking. I'm sending Katie a link to a handout I want to share with you a little bit later. I hope Katie got that. So you can check that and then help me share it with everybody. Thanks, Chandra. I Thank you, Eve, for setting this wonderful container. You know, the word for retreat in Tibetan is tsum, T-S-H-A-M, tsum. It's like aspirated tsum sound. And it literally means boundary. Um, it means to set a parameter so that you have that you feel that you can dive deep in your practice and not be disrupted or not even there's even the mental sum right as we meditate we set the intention to not be distracted to stay present to stay in our body to stay with our feelings stay present for ourselves that's a, a kind of a sum and so we're setting this boundary also within our sangha when we meet whether it's in person or online or even just sitting in the in the quietude of our own personal space at home, this kind of idea of having a nice, safe container so that we can all dive deep together collectively or individually. So I appreciate that and um, see its value and importance. So, so we felt like tonight, you know, because of the swift changes in our lifestyles abruptly altering in various ways that we would really focus on these some beautiful practices that we both have found a lot of, of relief and healing through, which is, of course, the Tonglen practice, which Eve will introduce through some slogans and, uh, and then also guide us in a Tonglen or sending and receiving practice. So I, that's a practice, as many of you may already know, is very close to my heart and um, and uh, is always a medicinal elixir and especially the rough times, the tough times. So I like Eve's uh, catchy phrase, Tonglen for tough times. <laughs> and so we're going to do that. And then later I will introduce a meditation, a mantra and a visualization uh, for the 20th Tara, there are 21 Taras, uh, 21 aspects of the divine feminine within tantric Buddhism. And so the 20th Tara is particularly pertinent for this time because she's the, she's the, the, the Tara who is uh, the mountain retreat Tara clothed in leaves who helps to pacify and heal all diseases and epidemics. So she is the one. And so it's a beautiful meditation. And even I thought that would be fun to share as well. So um, get ready for a rich night, I hope of healing for you personally, if you're also feeling at un unease, but also as a way to enact our bodhisattva intention to be a benefit in the world, even if we're stuck at home and can't really do a lot <laughs> physically. Thank you, Chandra. And yes, I was, we were talking earlier and I think Tonglen is a practice. I've seen Chandra just really, um, illuminate the hearts of many people with. She, she loves it so dearly. And for those of you who've been part of the Sangha for a while, you'll know that she's gone um, and taught all of the slogans or all of the kind of teaching part of Tonglen over the course of years. And we are going to look at a couple of those slogans. We don't have years tonight. And then we'll do the actual practice. And I wanna introduce this practice of Tonglen with what I hope is a really uplift idea, which is, Tong Len really helps us find the opportunity in our suffering or find the possibility of generating something really beautiful out of something, anything, which is really hard and difficult. 
This is very, for those of you again who sit with us, you know that this is always our orientation. How can we turn towards? How can we get deeper with that which is hard? How could we even put our head in the demon's mouth, as it were? And in this practice of Tonglen, it's that same emphasis that when things are difficult, when things are hard, there is a possibility of transformation. And the practice itself is one that has some really specific tools that can support us in doing so. If I just say to you right now, any anxiety you're feeling right now, any uncertainty, transform it. No problem, this is great. This is gonna help you in your awakening. Maybe you feel a little motivated and inspired, but probably you feel like, okay, um, where do I even start? You know, especially with these experiences of fear or anxiety, they're so embodied. It can be really hard to just break out of the kind of <clears throat> shell surface feeling of tension. So when we do the practice together, we'll, we'll focus on really not just breathing in a shallow way, right? Not breathing in a way that kind of gets caught in our chest or maybe in our throat, but really breathing through and using the breath as transformation. So in the simplest definition, our Tonglen practice requires that we recognize the shared nature of our challenges and difficulty. Right now, that's actually really easy to do. <laughs> Though we may have a different flavor of our challenge and difficulty, that is something that has risen to the surface right now. All of us, in some way or another, have our lives in curtailed, shifted, or changed, whether we can no longer do our high-intensity uh, workouts at the gym, uh, whether we are worried whether or not we have any financial stability, whether we miss hugging our friends, right? All of us right now can recognize this is a shared experience of pain. Now, what's really interesting about this is how do we then use that shared experience of pain to transform us? I'm going to give you just a couple of these slogans. These slogans are intended, there's the word slogan, if you haven't heard it before, it can be a little strange. You might think it has something to do with advertising. Uh, we're not trying to sell you anything other than maybe bodhicitta. Um, but the slogan here is really intended to have something that you let open your mind. A phrase or a word that really unlocks the potential of your mind and your heart. You know, when you hear someone say a simple word or phrase and all of a sudden you're like, oh, yes. That's what all of these slogans are for, is how do we open our heart? So the first one I want to share and, and let us kind of allow our mind to um, deeply mix with is turn all adversity into the path. And that slogan means that nothing that is happening is outside of our awakening. It's not as though I will get to my good meditation once this thing is gone. Once my you know, annoying uh, downstairs neighbor stops, stops making noise, or once I stop having all these emails from work about what's happening next, when those are done, when my computer's closed, then I'm gonna start my meditation practice. Then I'm gonna develop my heart of compassion. So this idea or this turning of the mind that all of our adversity is the path, it's a tough one. And it's one that's so beautiful to reflect on. And one I really encourage you to take, especially the next couple days, to consider. And we'll have, of course, a little bit of discussion around it. But turning all adversity into the path, it really also makes an enormous amount of spaciousness. If everything that happens is essentially a seed of awakening, then we can be without any preference <clears throat> or without any clinging towards certain kinds of experiences versus others, because all of them have this potential. The second slogan I'd like to share is, be grateful to everyone. This one is really, really tough. Uh, and I, I love how much it challenges me. I love how much it shows me where I'm stuck. This could be something simple, like whoever is you know, in front of me, now grocery stores have become our battlefields. Um, as they, you know, fill their cart with toilet paper. And I just can't imagine anything more um, subhuman than that level of, you know, consumeristic greed or whatever it is, right? How can I be grateful in that moment for that person? Because they're showing me where I'm stuck. I don't get to see how anxious they are in that moment. 
if I'm totally caught up in this idea that they are the enemy or they are wrong. So when we're grateful to everyone, you can feel that same flavor of turning adversity into the path. But it's this idea of being truly grateful to them. Thank you for showing me how I'm stuck. Thank you. And it's really tough to look at. It takes the courage of a warrior, which is why the practice requires that we really develop our compassion. Because when we start to look at how ungrateful we are for so many of the people we interact with, it can be overwhelming. One of the things I, I love reflecting on is just how many of our emotions, good and bad, involve other people. Uh, happy to say, I don't know of any published research on this. So any of you students out there looking for a great thesis topic, I highly recommend it. But all of us can be first person investigators and just consider how many of my emotions directly or indirectly involved another person. And especially our emotions of irritation or anxiety, of contempt, maybe even disgust. And can we, maybe not in the moment, maybe we've already experienced the emotion, can we look for that opportunity of being grateful? When we are feeling depleted, when we are feeling stressed, as many of us are right now, it's much harder for us to catch ourselves when we become irritated and anxious, when we feel despondent and despair. So then taking that really, um, taking the simple slogan to heart of, okay, be grateful to everyone, even elected officials. Well, we can, we can start small and work up to that. The third slogan, which I'd like to share with you all, one of my favorites of all time, a dear friend of mine is online tonight and her and I uh, go back and forth sharing this slogan back to one another. Sometimes we forget and that is abandon any hope of fruition or give up all hope of fruition. And that can sound pretty depressing <laughs> if you don't know the actual meaning of it. It doesn't mean give up hope. It means that all of your efforts, especially your efforts of compassion, do them free of expectation of how it'll turn out. So you keep at it. You keep with that level of this matters so much. It matters so much that I try to have great gratitude for everyone. It matters so much that I'm trying to understand this struggle and suffering as something that can transform me. And yet, if I still fly off the handle 10 minutes after this online session is over, okay, I'm doing my best. I am doing it with this full intention or view for transformation, but without any expectation of how it's gonna show up, how long it'll take, or whether or not these practices impact one another. That's a, a big one. So it's a really beautiful uh, set of three. I'll say them one more time. Turn all adversity into the path. Be grateful to everyone. Abandon any hope of fruition. So before we get into our Tonglen practice here together, I also want you to consider uh, an aspect of Tonglen that the wonderful teacher, uh, Pema Chodron, who probably many of us learned uh, Tonglen from her in one of her many books or online teachings, she describes these three levels of courage that are required in Tonglen. And she also says she's very forgiving, which uh, is, is helpful. She says, you can just stop with the first level, no problem, but it's nice to know all three levels. And the first level is just in our Tonglen practice, when we are struggling in the moment, when we feel anxious, when we feel overwhelmed, to have the courage to recognize, I am not the only one. No matter how unique and messed up your version of anxiety is, you can rest assured you are not alone, that other people are feeling something like you're feeling. So that's the first kind of courage of Tonglen and something we can do as Pema Chodron instructs us on the spot. So we're gonna do a practice here together in which we'll be in a more formal meditation, our, our eyes closed, focusing inward. But this is Tonglen that you can use as an attitude as you encounter all of these emotions throughout your day. So that first of, wow, this feels bad and I'm not alone. The second level of courage is also to take into account that you really hope that this can be transformed. You really hope that this level of challenge or difficulty that you're experiencing 
for yourself and everybody else is actually going to be that seed of awakening that I will learn from this. It's not the fantasy idea of, I don't want to feel this and I don't want anyone to feel this. Please make me stop feeling it. Uh, that's a kind of a near enemy in a way of this practice. So we recognize that others are suffering with us. And we also recognize that we want it to be different. We have an aspiration for it to be transformed. And she said the third level of practice, and this one is really hard, and it takes a bit more um, maybe familiarization with the slogans or time practicing. This is, can doing this practice, really my heartfelt aspiration of doing this practice, can I do it? and take on the difficulty and suffering so that others don't suffer. This is a part where people get caught up with Tonglen, the practice of taking in the suffering of others to transform it. And I understand why that's concerning. Many of us feel like I already have enough suffering with just trying to watch the news or listen to my family members with their concerns. Why would I take in more? And what it really gets to the heart to, and I spoke about this last week in our class together, is taking on that level of, in some ways, altruism. You could even call it sacrifice. May I take in the suffering so others could be free. That really helps us kind of erode the problematic parts of our ego, of our self-cherishing. I don't want that suffering. I just want to be okay. I'm going to do this practice so I'm okay. Can I do that? And so to really invite in the suffering is quite a courageous act. And indeed, it might feel uncomfortable. It might feel awkward. So don't rush it. So don't push it. Again, these practices are, can I recognize my pain as being like others' pain? Can I really have the courage to wish and hope that this could be transformed for myself and everyone? And can I take on, in this practice, the suffering so that others would not feel it? And it's beautiful. And we can also do Tonglen practice or an attitude of Tonglen for that which is good. Maybe some of you have noticed that there are parts of this um, experience of um, sheltering in place that feel okay. Maybe you got to watch the sunset a little more often, spend more time with a loved one or a pet. And in that moment, when you notice the, su the subtle goodness, you can also offer that to others for it to uplift their hearts, to be part of their transformation. So we don't have to just focus on what's hard right now. <clears throat> we can use Tonglen also for what's good. So with that, I'm gonna invite us to go into the practice here together. So please find a comfortable position for your meditation. We'll begin this practice by doing Tonglen for ourselves. By simply noticing in this moment what is here right now. Tuning in to the field of the body and the tactile sensations. Are there areas that feel stuck or tight? Especially notice and focus on any areas of tension throughout the face, through the forehead and the brows, the eyes, the cheekbones, the jaws, and your lips. And continue noticing sensations through the body. Inviting in whatever you may have been avoiding or rejecting.
And as you inhale, kindly inviting in any difficult sensations. And as you exhale, extending a warmth, a caring and a tenderness to the physical sensations of the body. Continue this generous practice for yourself right here of noticing the sensations of the body and extending a tenderness, a spaciousness, a release. You could imagine a quality of surrendering, <clears throat> letting go any of the tension, agitation, or tightness throughout the, all the muscles in the body, all the bones, even all the organs. while still feeling grounded within the body. Continue noticing another layer or level of your presence here, of your inner environment. Notice what's going on right now in the mind and in the heart without needing to get into the story specifically, just notice what does the feeling or emotion residue right And again, welcoming with a befriending attitude, whatever is here right now. As you inhale, welcoming and befriending. And as you exhale, extending a sense of spaciousness, of calm, of ease. using your full, slow breath to draw in, recognize and befriend. And to exhale and extend the spaciousness, this openness. Whatever thought, memory, image, or worry may arise as you're doing this practice, in that moment, make friends with it, release it, and extend this kind of tenderness and care. Now we'll gently shift. And as we begin our Tonglen practice for others, first we want to touch into the, our own nature of love and openness. We can do this by reflecting simply on all of the love which we have received up until this moment. And considering all the love which we have extended up until this moment. And if possible, imagining how much love in the future 
we will give and receive. And letting that recognition of what is nearly an infinite source of love really fill up the space of the chest and the body. Feel and touching into this intrinsic innate capacity to love, to receive and extend. Feel the confidence of that. Though our heart can be broken, this love is so much greater. It persists through, within and without. And it's from this infinite source of love that we draw upon the Tonglen practice. We can begin by considering one aspect of the challenges of our time right now. This could be the feelings of social isolation. This could be the feelings of uncertainty. Maybe someone specifically in your life comes to mind. Maybe a group of people who you know to be struggling or suffering. Though it may be hard to choose just one, let's begin by just considering one aspect of the challenge or difficulty that is present right now. And in this practice, we use visualization, bringing these people or persons vividly to mind. We then imagine that all of their struggles and difficulties could be poured into a single cloud of dark swirling smoke. Imagine this dark, dense cloud hovering in front of your midline, right in front of the belly button. And with our practice, our aspiration is to transform this suffering of others, to take it on and then release it as clear light and love. With our inhale, we focus on this dark swirling pool of smoke and we draw it in to the area of clear light, which is at our heart. And we don't hold it there. We don't absorb it in. We exhale that dark smoke out as clear light. So considering the motivation again of this practice, that we recognize there is no boundary between the suffering of others and our own, that we have an intention to transform it and that we care to take it on, to be of service to all with our compassion. Imagining this dark pool of smoke representing the struggle and suffering of others in the world right now. And drawing in that dark smoke into the radiant light of our heart and extending that out as love and warmth and spaciousness. Continue this process with your inhale and exhale as slowly as you would like. Receiving in the difficulty, sending out the love.
If you start to lose focus or get spaced out, just again, bring to mind vividly the specifics of the struggle you're considering. Now consider just a couple more breaths here. Imagining that dark cloud of smoke is becoming lighter, less dense, nearly immaterial. With renewed aspiration and intention, take in these lost dark wisps of smoke to the radiant light at your heart and extend out in all directions. Considering this wish, may all of us feel connected. May all of us feel the warmth of love. May all of us know our own true nature. And taking a moment to shift and consider all of us on this call right now. All of us with some unique flavor of struggle and difficulty in this moment. And all of us connected to others who are also having difficulty and struggling. And without the full visualization, just touching in to that heartfelt aspiration and motivation. May we all take on just a little bit for one another. May we all transform with the radiance of our heart and love, a little bit of what we are coping with and moving through. Using our breath to draw in this heartfelt aspiration, to be directly connected to one another with an aspiration of compassion. Drawing in and extending out that care Just as we are taking and receiving, we are also receiving the compassion of others, feeling that virtuous cycle of compassion and care and connection. And releasing all visualization and aspiration and resting in the breath and the body. Thank you all for your practice. We would love to hear some of your questions or reflections on this practice. And Katie, maybe you can help us find some that are coming in. Sure. Can we just talk like, <laughs> like we are doing? <laughs> sure, why don't we give that a try to start off? Yeah, I just wanted to mention thank you both and thank you Eve for this practice. Uh, I don't know if I never heard that instruction before that you said at the beginning where we were expanding our heart and mind 
beyond whatever it was happening at that moment. That was like a novelty to me. And it's something that I've been working in other practices. So thank you for bringing that aspect into my dongling practice. It, it makes me now more, much more confident that I'm much more than whatever I think are my problems or even my qualities. Mm, beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's, you know, very traditionally often described as, um, I think Chandra was saying earlier, you know, our, um, the purity of our mind, the, just the pure beauty and heart. Um, and for some people that we may not totally relate to that. So the idea is how to make it feel really relevant. Like I do have this indelible heart. Actually, I have all the evidence to believe that it is there and will continue to be there. So that's really, yeah, yeah. Chandra, any thoughts on that or other questions that are coming up? or reflections? Yeah, I think that, um, I, let's see a couple other questions if they come in and then I can add some stuff. Anyone else? You can unmute yourself if you know how to do that or type in a question to Katie and she's uh, on it. I'm curious how people felt that, you know, breathing in and breathing out. The Tonglen can be challenging for people when um, it feels really big, you know, whether it's disease, uh, epidemic, <laughs> breathing in, but this limitless heart, especially the beginning of that practice, where mm. or, or towards the middle beginning, where you said, feel the love you've received, the love you've given, the love you may give in the future. That really just felt my heart like exponentially starting to expand and a natural capacity to to breathe in the coronavirus or at least the suffering that i i imagine is happening throughout the world what i see on the news and around our community and then transform light and love and I, that helped my heart really pop open so thank you i had never heard that before i wonder how it was for other people too So people know how to use the chat function. It's that little dot at the bottom of the screen. You can click on it and then write it in there. Or I'll comment. Okay, go. Um, I thought it was really interesting for the past uh, week, I've been doing a lot of loving kindness. And I felt like this was a much more appropriate practice because it, it just was so imbued with the breath. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like this is this virus is attacking people's ability to breathe. So I, I really resonated with it. Thank you. We have some more coming. Yeah, sometimes I feel like metta is like a good foundation for Tonglen. It's a bit more edgy. You know, Tonglen is a little more advanced, intermediate, advanced level meditation prayer technique, right? Because with the metta, we're just sending out which is beautiful. I love the metta and it can, metta can take you all the way. It's not like metta is only a beginning practice, but it can be a great foundation for Tonglen where we not only send out prayers of healing and life with, with the breath, but we also have the courage and develop the capacity to breathe in the suffering of the world, transform it, and then breathe out the love, the, the prayer to be well and for those beings to be free of suffering. So it's a bit more edgy. I'm glad you found it to be more appropriate. And thank you for highlighting this point of the breath is so important right now. Without the breath, it's always important, isn't it? I mean, without breath, we're, we're not here anymore as we know it. Mm -hmm. Some people are saying, I really loved this deep breathing aspect because we all share the same air, yes. Um, I found it to be a really useful form of concentration practice. I didn't expect that. Hmm. We had one question that came in anonymously, um, which says, I feel I might have just taken in more pain and fear than I'm capable of holding, more so than the love and compassion I was able to feel. How do we find the balance? Hmm. <laughs> okay. That is a great, this, this comes up. This is why Tonglen, it, I think Eve, Eve gave a great introduction and it, it can take a while for people to 
uh, develop the feeling that they have the, the capacity to take on the so-called suffering of others. And there are kind of step-by-step -step lead in practices that you can do warming up to it as well, not just metta, but other practices as well. And also just a more in-depth study of the beautiful slogans. There are 59 slogans in the main Lo, Lojong texts that we study. There are many different Lojong texts, by the way, but one of the most popular ones is by a Tibetan master named Chekawa Yeshe Dorje, who synthesized Atisha's teachings. Who came, he, Atisha was Indian. He was an Indian Buddhist master who came from India to Tibet in around the 11th, 12th centuries. So Chekawa Yeshe Dorje synthesized those slogans into 59 and the first one is to contemplate the four thoughts that turn the mind. This is the preliminary practices. So contemplate impermanence, the precious human life that we have, how invaluable that is, um, karma, cause and effect, and also the unsatisfactory nature of samsara. So those are really preliminary. You could spend months just contemplating these four thoughts that turn the mind. And then after that first slogan, after you've done that, then you would study what's called the absolute bodhicitta, which means you're studying the teachings on interdependence and emptiness. Mm. And those slogans, like regard all dharmas as dreams, uh, investigate the nature of unborn awareness. These are very profound slogans that help us to develop a capacity to have um, a heart as vast as space, right? And so based on those deeper ultimate bodhicitta or teachings and slogans on emptiness, then it's not until slogan six or seven that we get into the actual relative level practice of donglen, sending and receiving, where we're then developing that capacity to have enough bodhicitta, enough heart to pull in the suffering. Because what we understand when we when we really contemplate interdependence and emptiness is we realize my heart isn't just a limited thing here that can only take in a certain amount of pain. It's actually the prayer is not a literal prayer. It's an aspiration. May I have the courage? May I even just simply make a prayer to take on? May my suffering represent the suffering of all beings. And then mm -hmm. through that unity, that sharing and that basic humanity, May I then transform it and send out the wish that all beings be free of that suffering, that they be purified of illness and disease. So we have to be careful not to take the Lojong and the Donglen practices too literally and have a softer, open, spacious approach to it of like, okay, even just taking this as an aspirational practice. And then over time, the, the heart becomes as wide as the world. Uh, it's not just a little limited Chandra heart and Eve heart and Katie heart. Our heart, our sense of self, the small sense of self cracks open. There's an old analogy of a, of a, of a woman who was a serious practitioner. She's a mother, a housewife. This is old medieval India. And she would practice at night when her children were asleep. And during the day, she'd practice her mantras and her meditation as she was washing the clothes and cleaning the house. And the story goes that she was down at the river one day, gathering water in a clay jug to take back up to the house. And as she was, and she had been contemplating the teachings and of Dharma. And as she turned to walk up the slope with her large clay jug full of water she slipped and dropped the jug and the jug hit the ground and cracked open and burst and in that moment of bursting she realized that her mind was like that jug her mind burst open and so her small sense of self burst and she recognized that the space within the jug was no different than the space outside of the jug and that that separation was just an illusion. So the separation of my heart is too small to take in. That's an illusion. But we can't, you, you have got to work to really feel that for yourself rather than me just saying that. But maybe yeah. even right now you feel that intuitively. It just takes time. Yeah, it takes time. And I want to highlight um, 
you know, I, I get asked this question a lot doing work in, in hospital settings. Um, and tomorrow morning, first thing, I'll be doing a training for um, some healthcare providers. And it's um, when you are on a day-to-day -day basis, especially for frontline providers right now, face-to-face -face with such a high volume of suffering, we still have to keep in mind what Chandra mentioned in the very beginning, which is the boundaries. And I think one of the ways this practice is really challenges us is, um, you know, really like recognizing and seeing the boundary of our experience, the boundary of others and, and holding the fact that this isn't happening to me and yet that person is no different. And that is, that's tough. That's a tough one to really <clears throat> hold. And it's what, you know, in, in psychological terms, we would call a reappraisal means that we're able to think about something or have a perception. We are really challenged to have cognitive capacity when we're really in the grip of our emotion. So if we're feeling the pain and suffering um, and triggering of our emotion, it can be hard for us to recognize this person's suffering isn't mine, but I care so much as though it were mine. And this is why we need the mind training, why we have to be able to stabilize our mind with things like mindfulness and shamatha so we can recognize when a feeling is arising and not get stuck in it. So all of these practices work together to give us that capacity. And it's not as though, well, if you feel pain when you do Tonglen, you're a bad practitioner. Um, it's more that, wow, yeah, there's so many moving parts for us to be able to do something, which is so simple of imagining the boundlessness of our heart. Because it really does go counter to, in some ways, the feeling of self-protection, which is an innate quality of us as humans. We want to avoid suffering. We want to survive. We want to feel good. Um, and so it's, I think it's a really beautiful one to experiment with. And we can try with things that might be um, a bit softer or easier. But in the caring professions, um, especially for folks right now, I think there will be suffering and pain. And so to maybe keep in mind that this suffering and pain isn't just useless. This suffering and pain, I'm going to dedicate it so that others can feel free from it. I'm going to dedicate it so I can be working on my own heart. I think it's not, it's the second arrow, not just I feel overwhelmed by suffering, but I feel overwhelmed by suffering and I shouldn't, right? It should be different. So we just work um, kind of moving in the edges bit by bit so that we can open our heart and have it be I love that vast as the ocean. Yeah. Maybe one last question, if there's one, Katie, that pops out to you. We had a hand raised, uh, but it just went down. So let's see. Um, yes. Yes. Um, something that I noticed was that there's there's this kind of like a like a pressure in my heart area and uh, I guess I kind of I equated that to like the suffering and I like held it and kind of went in and something interesting happened as I did that it like kind of dissolved and I got like blissful feelings um but it was an interesting thing is like it, it, what is that what is that ball in my heart like mm. what is that pressure thing i i'm just curious because i i do encounter it you know mm. uh, and, and sometimes you know if if i'm in the if i'm like not centered or not you know i can just like do other things and it and it still follows me and then until I finally go, okay, I'm just gonna lean into it, feel it, and then, and then I do that, and it just stays sometimes. Other times, I just gotta tweak my body a little bit. Other times, it does, like, kind of break open, and um, I feel the, the flow of whatever I, you know, the beauty. Mm. So I'm curious about that. Yeah, beautiful question. Chandra, I would love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> That's such a beautiful, deep question. Oh, oh, oh. 
I, I recognize what you're talking about. I, I've had that too. And um, also in not just, in just my heart, but in other parts of the body, maybe other energy centers, there can be pressure or a feeling of like knotted up energy. And as long as we're kind of ignoring it or trying to push it away, it can kind of just hibernate there or sometimes come out and get even stronger. And then when we turn to it, and listen to it or love it or let it in um one time i even had the feeling of devouring it you know like like eating it <laughs> it was i know that sounds far out but it's true like it was something about being willing to like take it in more that that released the energy of it and i felt felt it as bliss so this is a phenomenon that can happen for for us when we're diving more deeply into our spiritual practice when we're awakening we can feel the pressure of like an edge or a boundary this idea of boundary is very interesting in this call because it can manifest it can be good and it can also be a block but we can feel the boundary which is probably good for a while but then when it's time to go it needs to burst and then it bursts and then the, the energy released in that burst can be quite blissful it can also be other things it can be disorienting uh, this is a classic uh, phenomenon within like kundalini, you know, when the kundalini opens up through the central channel, it's like unraveling the knotted up energy at the base of the spine. And sometimes also at the heart chakra, there can feel that sense of weight, weight on it, pushing on it. What's interesting, and this is the last thing I'll say, is um, there are some times when in the, in the meditative traditions where they say if you have a persistence of a heart pressure or a feeling of anxiety also is a way it can feel in the heart um, we have to be careful not to um, get overly ambitious with our meditation practice it's actually a time to like ease off and take a walk or have a cry or get a massage or go for a swim you know just just release any kind of pushing or pressure that we might be efforting in our actual spiritual practice and loosen and let that unravel so that that energy can dissipate because we don't want to create an imbalance in the heart chakra or the heart center as well okay thank you okay good so so now we're moving into the um yeah thank you for your questions everybody and we do see some comments too very beautiful comments and i do want to thank the for the anonymous call for the courage somebody did write that in thanking you for your anonymous question it's not easy to ask these questions you know we always want to get things right and then what if we're the one in class that doesn't get it or isn't feeling it so always these questions are welcome and sometimes with our first dose of medicine it tastes bitter and we don't quite get it but then if we take it a little more it can it can start to feel sweet and the body can even crave it so uh, now we're going to end with some high tech Buddhism. You know, I always like to say tantric Buddhism or Vajrayana, uh, which means the diamond vehicle, is very much based on the early teachings of, of Buddha and the wisdom of India. And then it flowered during the during its renaissance around the fifth century CE into a, I would like to say like an, a high tech a technology to use the mind to help transform and purify the mind. So I'm going to take you on a ride. We're going to have a high-tech Dharma experience in the last half hour or so of our call. And I'm going to share my screen. So in Tantra, the high-tech part of it is that we're using mantra visualization, pranayama, so breathing exercises, which Tonglen is just the tip of the iceberg. It's quite simple but beautiful. Um, but so pranayama, the yogas, uh, movements through the bodies to purify the channels in the body, just uh, an understanding of chakras and channels and prana, all of that is tantric technology. You see it in hatha yoga, you see it in the Hindu tradition as well as the Buddhist tradition. You also get little hints of it in the Jain tradition as well as um, you would never think, but also there's some within the Muslim tradition as well. It's very, it's not that common. So, but for the most part, this practices of mantra recitation, visualization, um, deity, yoga, it's called, um, and yoga, pranayama, also sexual union, that's all found within tantra because we're using the body and the mind to awaken in this body. So it's not about get it going up and out of the body to wake up, but it's about really becoming a vajra body, 
purifying your mind and your body so that you become this adamantine diamond like luminous body here and now not sometime later like when we die and go to heaven or something so it's about heaven on earth enlightenment through embodiment integrating all the senses the pleasure the pain the sight sound taste touch smell thought feeling into the path of awakening but Donglen is about to on a certain in a certain way transforming adversity onto the path transforming all joy and adversity onto the path so both pleasure and pain okay so during the Tantra era, many different deities, both goddesses, what's interesting about Tantra is the feminine became very important and it was, it was wonderful. So as a, as a woman, I feel very drawn to these teachings because you really see an embracing and an elevating of women to be of equal status with men and also an appreciation of a non-gendered absolute truth and also the union between the two polarities of masculine and feminine. So it's a very interesting um, approach to spiritual life. And Tara, which literally means the protectress or the goddess or the Buddha, the female Buddha who protects beings, became very important. Um, she mainly protects beings from fear. Certain, there are different aspects of Tara and in her more wrathful, fierce form, she's associated with the Hindu Kali or Durga so there's some, some meeting point and some intersection there as well. But she also uh, manifests in peaceful expressions and uh, semi-wrathful and semi-peaceful. But these are all, all of these deities are understood to be expressions of our own mind. Expressions of our own mind. So in a way we can understand these as archetypes. And so as Jung, Carl Jung said, the subconscious communicates through imagery. And so we can use imagery to transform our psyche, to transform our subconscious and our conscious mind. And this is why I say Tantra is high tech. We're using the mind, visualization, mantra, and so on, to help the mind to transform and to open into an experience of actually who we really are. Our innate nature is primordially pure, manifesting a ceaseless compassion, that love that Eve helped us tap into at the, in the Tonglen practice. That is actually who we really are. And all of our suffering and our fear and our pain, they, they're, they're like you know veils that are clouding due to our karmic conditioning and so on. They veil our true nature. And so the deity yoga, Tantric practices are helping us to purify and remove those veils so we can um, come home to who we really are. Okay. And so I made this little handout at the top of the images uh, as a statue from Tara Mandala. We have 21 three quarter life size Taras at Tara Mandala in the Tara temple. Some of you have been there. It's a very beautiful place. This is an image of the 20th Tara. Uh, she said to her name is Tara Ritra Loma Gyunma. Ritra Loma Gyunma, which means no, noble lady of mountain retreat, clothed in leaves who removes contagious diseases. So for me, she's like the medicinal Tara. Medicinal leaves are her clothes. And on her, she's holding in her right hand an Utpala flower. The stem is in her hand. And then the flower. Um, rises up to her left shoulder and upon the lotus flower there, it's called the Utpala flower, it's a medicinal flower in Indian lore. Upon that flower is a, a, a vase, a medicinal vase filled with medicinal nectar. And she's saffron in color. So behind her, you'll see the artist painted a, a like a halo she's got a lighter golden halo and then a saffron red orange color so that's her color and she's a body of light a being of light and she has a, a mantra associated with her that we'll learn in a moment 
And the idea is that as we recite the mantra, we can either pray to her out there as a being um, who's in space in front of us, uh, saffron in color, luminous light body, sending healing energy to all beings. But the next, the, another option is to actually imagine that you are her, that you are a being of light. And you, as Dara, Ritu Loma Gimma, you are this enlightened, loving, you know, powerful being who has the capacity to send healing light and purify all diseases and epidemics through your power and your mantra. So I'll let you choose whether you invite, imagine her as a being in space in front of you or you want to become her and really feel that it's a, it's a way of embodying your intrinsic potency and awakened nature. So I invite you to choose which one feels good for you. Um, you'll see that uh, the, the mantra is Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Nama Tare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Nama Tare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha so in a moment, we'll recite this together. You can read it uh, as much as you need to until you feel it's in your body. If you're familiar with the Tara practice, the main Tara mantra is very similar to this. It's Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Swaha. So Swaha means may it be so. It's a common ending to any mantra that's associated with the feminine deity. May it be so. I have a Sanskrit scholar helping me translate this mantra, so I don't have a translation for it yet. But what's interesting is also mantras aren't really traditionally translated so much, but it is nice to kind of know the, the meaning of it. But essentially through this mantra, we're praying for her swift um, aid, her love and compassion and her powerful nectar vase to emanate nectar in all directions. And then I want to read the description so you understand what is the gist and what are we visualizing. It says, Ritu Loma Gyanma is peaceful and yellow, red like saffron. Devotedly reciting her mantra dispels all deadly epidemics. Upon her Udpala flower is a round vessel filled with nectar. Her eyes are like the sun and the full moon. From the sun of her right eye, shines radiant light, destroying all disease-bearing beings. So we can imagine that light spreading out and purifying all the little coronaviruses and all other disease-bearing beings you can think of. And then from the moon in her left eye, a rich stream of nectar descends, healing all forms of disease, including their causes and consequences. So that's a lot. So you'll, you might for a while focus on one thing and then the other thing and just feeling like you're a being of light. You might focus on the mantra for a while. So now we'll, we'll shift into this practice and um, I'll guide you through it. We'll recite the mantra for about 10 minutes and then we'll conclude the practice and we'll end the call, okay? Does that sound good? Do you have any questions? Should I, have I covered it? Okay. All right. So go ahead and let's all recite the mantra a few times together as a way to kind of warm up and then I'll have you close your eyes. So I'll say it three times very slowly and then just know that when we recite it together, I'll begin very slowly so you can follow along with me. And again, if you choose not to recite the mantra, you could just listen and enjoy the sound. Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Namatare Manohara Hunghara Swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Namatare Manohara Hunghara Swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Namatare Manohara Hara Swaha. Okay, so it's, it's a good one. It's a little long, but it's a good one. Okay.
So I'm gonna ask people to mute themselves. I love the idea of all of us sounding together, but because of delay, it can be distracting. Thank you. We've tried, believe me, we've tried to do it all together before and it's not quite as good as we want it to be. So, but feel free to recite it out loud or quietly to yourself. So now let's drop in, find a comfortable seat and take a few deep breaths, settling in. And opening to this kind of curiosity of something new, of this ancient technique that may bring some benefit and relief for you of a beginner's mind, an open, open mind. And either gently gazing at the image of Tara or bringing her to mind in your mind's eye, feel and sense this benevolent, loving female Buddha appearing yet empty in front of you and above you in the space. She's a being of light, not material like a normal body. She's appearing yet empty like a rainbow in the sky, luminous, vibrant, loving. And she's saffron, red, golden color. She's seated upon a moon disc and a lotus flower. Her right leg is slightly forward, meaning she has one leg in samsara. She's one leg present with us in this world. And her left leg is tucked in close to her perineum. That means one leg means she's partially in nirvana. Her left hand is at her heart, holding the Apala stem. And the top of the flower is a, a vase of medicinal nectar. Her right hand is on her knee and palm facing forward. This is the mudra of generosity. If you wish, you can take this position, palm outward in the spirit of giving, giving healing, giving light, giving love. So feel Tara and her protective healing power. You can either imagine her in front of you or you can just go ahead and imagine now that you are her. In either case, she's a being of light power and potency. And from her right eye, the right eye is like the sun and it emanates rays of light, of healing light. It pacifies, cures, destroys all disease bearing beings. And from her left eye, which is like a full moon, flows healing nectar. This stream of nectar descends and heals all forms of disease including their causes and consequences. And as we recite her mantra, imagine that you are sending out this healing light and nectar, or if she's above you, she's sending it out in all directions, healing all beings near and far, including yourself, your family, your loved ones, your community, our state, our country, our continent. But we can focus on the coronavirus, but also all other illnesses, all other illnesses and beings who may be suffering. We dispel the epidemic through our prayer. Imagine this light permeating all of space enveloping the world with healing light. And we can begin with the mantra. I'll do 21 times slow and then I'll speed up a little bit. Do 108. 
Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Om Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Om Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Om Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Namatare Manohara Hung Hara Swaha 
Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hum Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hum Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hum Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hum Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Namadare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Re Nama Dare Manohara Hong Hara Swaha So now imagine that Tara dissolves into radiant light, golden saffron light. And if you are Tara, you imagine that you dissolve from the crown of your head down and the soles of your feet up, imagining that you're dissolving into the heart space, the heart chakra, the orb of radiant light, 
dissolving into that orb of light at your heart center. And then that dissolves into luminous emptiness and rest in spacious awareness for a few moments. Just allow yourself to rest in uncontrived, unfabricated nature of your own luminosity, your own innate Buddha nature. Rest in that spacious experience, awareness vast like space. And then coming back into your body, feeling your feet or your hips on the ground, feeling the breath in the body, the heartbeat beating in your chest. And feel the solidity of your normal human form, but merged with it integrated with that luminous light body of Tara, that healing capacity within you. And we can end this meditation practice with a prayer of dedication, dedicating for the benefit of all beings through our practice of Donglen or Mantra, mindfulness, whatever our practice might be, even the practice of kindness and awareness. May we be of benefit in the world. And may this energy spread out in all directions and bring healing and a swift cure for this disease and all diseases, especially the disease of separation and ego clinging that separates us from our true nature. We dedicate all of our merit for the benefit of all beings. We offer it up. E maho, how wonderful. May it be so. So that concludes your little high tech journey into the realm of the Tata, the 20th Tata. I hope you enjoyed it and felt some kind of sense of connection and nourishment or healing through that. Or if not, that's okay too. Huh? Gives you a taste, you know, if you only have experienced Vipassana, which is a great, which I love Vipassana, it's also fun to stretch and to feel, oh, what, what are those tantric Buddhists doing over there? <laughs> it's a little different. Might be interesting. Okay, good. So thank you, everybody. And um, thank you. Uh, Kathy shared the, the link there in the group chat. It's a bit.ly link. So thank you for that. You can download it, use it for your own practice. Feel free to do this. And also, if you're curious to learn more, I will be doing this practice actually with more detail on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. streaming live on the Facebook channel for Taramandala Retreat Center. You just go on Facebook and search Tara Mandala Retreat Center. Uh, on Facebook, you'll see uh, that there will be a live stream with me on Sunday morning at 10 Pacific. So you can join in and do it again. Mm. So you've started to feel the mantra come alive, but you want more practice, then you can join. And yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was so beautiful. Um, yeah, and just lovely to experience and wanting to... Um, just say so much gratitude for everybody showing up this evening and being together. It makes it feel really special and connected to know folks are coming in from all different places. Um, and want to just put a special shout out there to our Dharma Center in San Francisco. Um, there's so many new faces that we don't see there and that's lovely. And 
um, we want to encourage you to your means able uh, to support our center. And I know um, Katie will give some details about that. It's a completely volunteer run center. And so that means that it's a collective in the truest sense. And I'm so excited about how we're flourishing now in these much changed times. But thank you, Tondra, and thank you, everyone. It's really been a highlight for me to be here with you all.